Hey, it's Elise Hugh, and you're listening to TED Talks Daily, the summer book club series. Today, we're highlighting an episode of the TED Interview podcast featuring novelist Jennifer Egan. You know her as the author of A Visit from the Goon Squad and most recently, The Candy House. She sits down with host Steven Johnson to talk about her writing process and how she weaves ideas about technology and the internet into her books. Welcome to the TED Interview. I'm Steven Johnson. If you've been following the news from the technology world, you might have noticed that the headlines have gotten a little, well, strange lately. I mean, one big tech company is convinced that in the next few years, we'll all be moving to someplace called the metaverse. And just down the road from that tech company, another tech company is debating whether they've just created an AI that thinks and feels. And uh, also, people are making and losing vast fortunes by buying and selling digital images of bored apes. Now, these are exactly the kind of turbulent developments that we like to examine and understand here at the TED interview, usually by talking to scientists or futurists or tech critics who can guide us through these new worlds. But there's another kind of guide that has always been an important resource for societies trying to make sense of sudden change, the storyteller. And today we have as our guest one of the great storytellers of our time, Pulitzer Prize winning novelist Jennifer Egan. Egan is the author of six novels, including A Visit from the Goon Squad, which won both the Pulitzer Prize and the National Book Critics Circle Award. Her latest book, a sequel of sorts to Goon Squad, is The Candy House. It's a dazzling alternate history of our present moment, weaving together threads about virtual reality, human memory, drug escapism, archetypal narrative structures, games, and much more. We wanted to talk to Egan about the continued relevance of the novel in a world teeming with technological novelty and how she manages to write books that flirt with sci-fi futurism without falling into the usual dystopian tropes. Jennifer Egan, welcome to the TED interview. Thank you. So much to talk about. First off, congratulations uh, on the new book, The Candy House. There is a lot going on (laughs) in this book. To me... um, uh, you know, it, it's very hard to capture the full range of it, but you're in the middle of book tour. Y- you must have a, a, some kind of standard explanation of of what this book is. Can you at least share that with our listeners? Sure. So I, I think I'll just start by setting up the opening of it, which in a way is where it started for me, which is that a tech, a very successful tech icon, who is extremely famous, is having a midlife crisis because he has no idea what he is going to do next, what his new idea is. The idea that he's had is, I'm positing, basically, social media. He's invented it. And he, but he feels like he's a failure because he can't find the next step. So because he's surrounded by people who just want to please him, as I think famous people often are, he goes in disguise disguised as a graduate student, to a Columbia University discussion group of academics. And he's really just hoping for some sort of new idea to spark him. And he actually finds such an idea. And the idea is that of externalizing consciousness as a way of reaccessing one's own memories for a start, and revisiting one's own past in a more complete way from a present-day perspective. And part of what inspires him to invent this, it's not just what he hears in the academic discussion group in disguise, but a wish of his own to remember the details around a really important event for him and another character in the book, which is that after a night of partying in 1993, they stood next to the East River, all of them at NYU students, and they talked about the future And then two of them went walked down the river together, went swimming, and one of them drowned. So Bix was the last person to see these two before that happened. And he wants to remember that morning 
better than he does because, of course, our memories are very scant if you look at them closely. I mean, if you say, I'm going to remember a day, how much do you remember about that day? A few little moments that you go over again and again. So he wants all of it. And that is really the impetus for the invention, which I then explore from many, many angles as it impacts all kinds of people's lives, often just in the sense of watching people use this machine to view their own consciousnesses or each other's, which is another important facet of the machine. And that is, in a way, becomes both the more revolutionary aspect of the machine and also the more controversial aspect. There's an interesting kind of doubling here, which is that the memory he is tracking down this this tragic event in the East River is if if the reader has actually read your earlier work, this is a scene that actually takes place in Goon Squad. And so Bix is searching for this memory. And if you're a regular Jennifer Egan reader, you yourself are remembering this thing that you read, you know, 10 years ago in, in a novel. What was the point at which you decided to build off of the world that was that was so you know wonderfully captured in in Goon Squad you know in a way i think that i never really stopped thinking about it the chapter in which the drowning occurs and you're exactly right we the readers of that book have actually witnessed this event we certainly don't need to have done that or remember it to experience the candy house but that was one of the later chapters i wrote for goon squad i think it was the second to last one and it's such a huge event that it felt a little like just having this happen and then walking away from it didn't feel like quite enough. You know, we lose the protagonist of that chapter <laughs> in the course of of the chapter. And so that was one of many things in Goon Squad that felt not exactly unresolved, but it felt a little cavalier to just leave it as is. I mean, the nature of these books is that we're inside a different consciousness in every chapter. And of course, each person is the center of our own cosmos, really. We are the product of our past, our geography, our circumstances, our ethnicity. And so it's inevitable that each one introduces a whole host of experiences and characters that could conceivably be explored. And the drowning was one of those cases. So the two people involved, other than the person who drowns, namely Bix and another man named Drew, whom we learn a lot more about in the course of The Candy House, they are very touched by this event. And I just felt right to take ownership of that and get in there and look at what the aftermath would be like. You were such a formally inventive writer. Goon Squad famously has this extended PowerPoint sequence in the second half of it. There are a number of amazing, almost magic tricks that you pull off in the candy house. I guess one of my questions to you is, like, at what point in the process do you think about how to structure the stories you're going to tell? Um, I, I, I've had a couple of books that I've written where there was like an architecture for the book that I had in mind, and it took me a couple of years to come up with the actual content to put inside of it. Does that sometimes happen to you, or do you start with a series of characters and, and then figure out the right structure to present those characters in their lives through? It's a little bit of a combination. I often have a wish list of things that I would like to try. So, for example, mm -hmm. PowerPoint was on that list long before I was <laughs> able to use it because it's actually really hard to write fiction that works in PowerPoint. I definitely had a wish list in my mind as I worked on Candy House. I hoped I could write something in the first person plural as we. I hoped I could have an epistolary chapter completely in the form of letters. I really wanted to use Twitter. So there were certain things I knew I wanted to do, but that in and of itself doesn't lead to anything. My entry point when I actually write fiction, oddly enough, is time and place. And I write my first drafts very improvisationally because I'm looking to get beyond what I can think of consciously. My conscious ideas are not good enough, frankly. They're not original. So I've got to get out from under those and get to something that surprises even me. And what I have found so far, knock wood, is that the, in the end, I'm usually able to imagine my way into a story, ultimately, that requires 
a form from my wish list, but it takes a lot of trial and error. I have to find a story that can only be told in an unusual format. So I'm looking to what I write to tell me how to write it. It's so interesting hearing you talk about those first drafts where you're struggling to su- surprise yourself on some level. And uh, I was kind of curious, are, do you find that you are funny on the first draft or is the comedy something that takes a lot of iterations to get right? Because it, it feels so un- unforced and, and you know, laugh out loud at, at, at various points in the book. The comedy tends to happen spontaneously. I'm not a big jokester in real life. I actually am terrible at remembering jokes. I'm not someone who creates comedy at a dinner table. Believe me, I wish I were. What I think the comedy comes about through the improvisation, because the nature of improv, at least when I watch dramatic improv, let's say, I've never done it, is finding a line of action and and pushing into it. Like, you don't pull back. You just keep going. And if something feels alive, you push harder into it. If you If I do that on the page, I find that it naturally leads to comedy. It leads to extremes, one of which is often comic, although there's often another side to it. And in fact, in the chapter we were just talking about, things take an absolutely different turn toward the end of the chapter. And Chris actually thinks to himself, there has been a genre switch. So I'm looking to exploit every possibility about the situation I find myself in dramatically as I write. And so the the comedy tends to happen pretty early or in revision as I realize I haven't pushed hard enough. I, I want to get to the comedy generally. Speaking about the genre shift, so w- one macro question I came out of reading this book, having read Goon Squad, is the overall structure of it, the, this kind of genre. And, and there's maybe some other equivalents of books that have a, a little bit of this structure, but you really have developed it in, in these two novels in, in, in a really powerful way. One of the reviews in the Times kind of compared it a little bit to the feeling of navigating through social media, right? That you're, you know, you land on somebody's page and that links to somebody else's page who's vaguely related to them, who you kind of know, and then you end up on somebody else's page. To me, I, I was thinking back to, you know, kind of the big triple-decker novels of the 19th century, if you think about the number of characters that you meet over the course of, you know, Bleak House or or Middlemarch, it's probably comparable. There's there's a big, you know, kind of sociological net that that is thrown out in those books. But they're more linear. They generally follow, a, you know, a straight timeline. You have a clearer sense of a central protagonist or a small group of protagonists. And so there's something different, even though you're you're covering the same overall amount of people. You know, you could have written this in a traditional linear way and figured out, you know, two or three central protagonists and then had a bunch of cast of characters. You didn't do that. Why? I think that Because I think it actually may be related to technology. I mean, it's, you know, it's interesting when people say it feels like moving through social media. That was very surprising to me when I wrote Goon Squad because I was barely on social media. (laughs) But I think that in a way, it's social media is sort of a metaphor for the feeling I want people to have as they move through these books, which is really that we're moving in and out of consciousnesses. We're Mm -hmm. moving in and out of people's minds. The thing that fiction can do that no other narrative art form does in the same way, in my opinion, is actually give us a sense of being inside another human being. So if we're looking at an image of that human being, we are by definition in exactly the opposite position. We are on the (laughs) outside. So what I, and, and the 19th century novels absolutely give us that sense of interiority. We move in and out of people's minds all the time. And there's also often a narrator with a specific personality who, who weighs in and editorializes. I want to have that same feeling of flexibility and motion and the ability to go inside people's minds and then out of those minds and into the, the mind of the, of the other person, let's say. Somehow, for me, that feeling is best achieved through fragmentation, through combining smaller pieces, than writing it straight through in a linear way. And that may be because because of technology and a kind of fragmentation that exists in our consumption of technology. One more thing I'll add is that in my mind, what I'm thinking of is not the Internet 
per se. With A Visit from the Goon Squad, I was thinking about record albums and the way that smaller, that songs, which are, you know, smaller pieces of music, combine in, let's say, a concept album. Like, we can use a contemporary example like Beyonce's Lemonade. Small pieces that sound different from each other combine to tell one big story. And with this one, I thought more about like game playing and the way that, for example, with Dungeons and Dragons, <laughs> you are moving among worlds, which are written often by hand on graph paper, worlds and scenes in which everything is different depending on where you are. And essentially, you're moving through portals in and out of imaginary worlds. And I imagined in the Candy House that we are moving through portals in and out of people's minds. You talked about the power of the novel to allow a reader to enter the consciousness of another human being, which which I agree is maybe it's great power compared to all other forms of art. And in the book, you have a line near the end about, in a sense, the relationship between Bix's technology, which is called Own Your Own Unconscious, this memory storing and sharing device. And a character observes near the end of the book that Own Your Own Unconscious posed an existential threat to fiction. And and so there's a there's a sense here in imagining this technology that it, it 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 would be the one thing that could do what the novel has historically done incredibly well. This would take it to a new level when you actually are entering the the, the mind and the experience of of being another sentient human being in the world. Talk about that. <laughs> yeah, well, I think that what when I imagine this machine, what it seems that it would make it so appealing. Like, I would love to review some of my memories. But it's this this drive toward authenticity that I think all of us feel if we, as, as modern people, living in a largely mediated world. And the wish for authenticity is as old as the screen. <laughs> and I've been thinking about it ever since I read a book by Daniel Borston called The Image. All he's talking about is television because there was no mass media. Pseudo events. That was his big phrase, pseudo events, right? These kind of like fake, fake events. Yeah, Exactly. And what he talks about is that the events that appear on television are fake. They are made for television, although they feel real. And he, he, he talks about things like press conferences, let's say. But the viewer can sense that fakery or that artificiality. And so it leads to a hunger for authenticity and a kind of the beginning of a kind of, um, you know, a, a little bit of an obsession with authenticity. But then the media tries to satisfy that craving through ever greater feats of mediation that feel authentic, but in fact are not which leaves the viewer still hungry. And it's a cycle that I think can explain pretty much every media development I've seen up to the present moment, right up to last night when I was on the subway with my son and he suddenly took a picture of the two of us. And I said, why are you doing that? And he said, it's this app. And I'm so sorry, I've forgotten the name. And the idea is that suddenly everyone who's on this app is told, snap a picture of yourself right now. It, and they don't know when that will come. And they do. And the idea is it's totally authentic. There's no way to prepare. There's no way to, you know, me mediate or, or create the situation. You just, boom, tell us where you are. And I thought, oh, my God, Daniel Borston, <laughs> here we are. <laughs> so I, I am interested in exploring this in all kinds of ways, and, and I do in the novel. Some of them, you know, really crazy. I mean, there's a guy who's so obsessed with authenticity that he takes to screaming in public to elicit authentic reactions. And there are all kinds of other moments where that idea comes up. But it's, it's really part and parcel of our media diet. One of the things that I think has been a consistent theme of the response to Candy House that, that I share is that the book has an openness to the potential 
positive side of this technology. Does it does does it surprise you to hear that from readers and critics? Is that how you thought of it as you were writing it, or was that a kind of an unintended consequence? I think the, the the unintended consequence is whenever I hear anyone describe it as dystopian, because for me as a writer, dystopia is not interesting. I'm not excited by it. It's there's no invitation for me to write fiction that is dystopian. So I am driven by curiosity and and honestly delight mm. <laughs> in exploring the lives that I explore. And I would never have written about technology if all I could bring to it was judgment and fear. Because, again, it's not that that's not legitimate. And as a parent and a citizen, I do feel, you know, worry, a, a lot of worry about technology. But as a writer— I, what I bring to it is curiosity. How does it inter- interact with people's lives? And what can I do with that that will be fun? That is the bottom line question that I'm always asking. What can I do with that that will be fun? When I see streaming or when my son tells me about an app, when I finally learned what a blockchain was, I thought, <laughs> what can I do with that that will be fun? Can I can I use blockchain to write fiction? I'm still asking myself that question. That's my sensibility. And it. I hope there's a feeling of openness and joy and humor because I just feel like that is what I want to do as a fiction writer. And I'm a journalist, too. So I can if I want to get out there and and, you know, engage very directly with the culture around me and even offer up opinions, I have another realm to do that. For me, fiction is about confronting the mystery and really honoring the mystery and the complexity of human life, and to do it in a way that is fun. I, I want to just zoom out one layer here as we get to the end of this amazing conversation. And that is something that we've kind of danced around a little bit, which is really the the role of the novel in helping people m- make sense of technological change. And here again, I, I kind of think back to the 19th century tradition as well. I mean, that was a big part of what Dickens was trying to do, is make sense of the new reality of industrial lives. So much of what the novel was doing at that point is to say, okay, we're going to make this really new experience kind of coherent to you and give you a way of turning it into an understandable kind of story. And I'm, I'm curious, is that an important role for the novelist in society still? Well, to me, any work of art is an artifact of the dream life, if you will, of the cultural moment that creates it. And in the end, art is really all we have left with which to recreate human history. (laughs) Art is what lasts. And fiction, which is relatively new, certainly newer than, say, the visual arts or sculpture, is is a, a, a particularly narrative artifact of the collective dream life of the moment that makes it. And the reason I say dream life is that it in fiction, there's so much information compressed, but also there's a kind of, it's a symbolic text. And I think the metaphor really holds because, you know, all of us dream at night and we create these rich symbolic texts out of the everyday stuff of our lives. And sometimes they're very obvious, like I'm late and I can't get there or whatever, but sometimes they're really hard to interpret and make us question what what exactly we are thinking about. And to me, that is what fiction does for the cultural moment. And my my writing process is all about just trying to let as much of the world around me into the work as I can, because to me, that's where the relevance and the value really comes from. And in terms of what what role fiction performs, I think it it can perform the role of being an artifact that is provoking and, well, hopefully entertaining and transporting, but also provoking in the way that a powerful dream can be and and inviting us to ask questions about the moment that we occupy. And I think that the, we are more and more aware as we become more and more data-obsessed as a culture— of the need for storytelling. I'm kind of fascinated by the degree to which everyone wants to create a story around everything. But I think that impulse is really reasonable because data on its own is nothing. (laughs) It's just facts. It's the interpretation of that data 
that is the crucial element, and that is the storytelling. We are drowning in data, but what what part of it are we supposed to be looking at and what are we supposed to be making of it? And that paradox between the inundation of data and the 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 interpretive need to actually make something of it was one of the things I was really thinking about actively as I worked on this book and the way in which data can describe human behavior in large numbers, but human beings ourselves remain extremely mysterious to ourselves and to each other. And I feel like the, the job of the novel is to enter that mystery and give us human life in all of its hilarity and complexity and mystery. Mystery is a great place to to end on. I think we we have a question on the show that we ask all of our guests, um, which, which is, what is the mystery that's still out there, the kind of the unsolved problem in your field or just in society around you um, that you're m- most intrigued to find the answer to? I think that the problem I would like to see solved is the problem of the Internet prompting a cultural psychosis in which people cannot distinguish between reality and illusion. You know, my brother was schizophrenic, and we were extremely close. He took his life in 2016 because a lifetime of living with psychosis was so exhausting and so difficult for him that he gave up. He ran out of energy. I find it terrifying and deeply concerning to see a psychosis that is overwhelming the inner lives of lots and lots of people who believe things that appear to be substantiated by fact. That's the nature of psychosis. My brother heard voices in his head telling him that the things he believed were true, but 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 things that actually are not true culturally. So the big lie, QAnon, all of that is really I feel very sympathetic to the people who believe these things. They are receiving information that tells them that these things are true, and yet they are not. That's the definition of psychosis, and I don't know how we solve that. Well, this has been a fascinating conversation. So many aspects of your work are just really resonate with this moment and all the issues that we're all wrestling with. And the work is also just incredibly entertaining uh, and delightful and and full of fun at the same time, which is a rare combination. So, Jennifer Egan, thank you so much for joining us today. Such a pleasure. Thank you. The TED Interview is part of the TED Audio Collective. The show is brought to you by TED and Transmitter Media. Sammy Case is our story editor. Fact-checking by Miri Yesutasen. Farah DeGrange is our project manager. Greta Cohn is our executive producer. Special thanks to Michelle Quint and Anna Phelan. I'm your host, Stephen Johnson. For more information on my other projects, including my latest book, Extra Life, you can follow me on Twitter at Stephen B. Johnson or sign up for my Substack newsletter, Adjacent Possible.